Salut, film fans. Let's say you want to get around the city, you've got some place to go, maybe you're bringing a friend and dropping them off somewhere as well, but you want to get there quickly. You don't have a lot of time. What can you do to speed things up? Maybe you can just cut out little portions of time. Obviously in the real world you can't do that, but in film you can. And that's what we're going to talk about today when we consider the driving around Paris sequence in the 1960 film Breathless for this episode of Break the Scene. Hey film fans, just a reminder that I'm now on Patreon and if you want to support the channel a little bit further, head on over there and throw me a couple of ducats. Not only can you help the channel out, but you can also find new content which I'm uploading every week, including my new The Week in Movies series which started about six or seven weeks ago and which I post every Friday where I talk about developments in the business, with performers, with directors, whatever happened that week and however I might want to riff on it. The link's in the description and I'd love if you'd help me out. Thanks. Breathless is the 1960 feature film debut of director Jean-Luc Godard, who also wrote the script, which was based on a story by Francois Truffaut and Claude Chabrol. These were all friends who had worked together at Cahiers du Cinéma and were now entering the world of filmmaking, film directing. Chabrol and Truffaut had, in the previous year, 1959, had their first successes, and this was what was kicking off what's known as the French New Wave. And if you've watched my previous videos in the French Spring series on uh, Agnes Varda's Cleo from 5 to 7 and Louis Malle's uh, Elevator to the Gallows, you know that the French New Wave, like all artistic movements, didn't just start with the 500 blows or even breathless, that there were roots or seeds even <laughs> in the 1950s. But once these Cahiers du Cinema directors started making films, started making films together, helping each other, and started really kind of doubling down on the new approach to style, new approaches to theme, new approaches to what you could do on film or what you should do with film, um, that's really considered the beginning of the French New Wave. And it's also important for kicking off a few other careers. Specifically, the cinematographer, Raoul Coutard, who worked with Godard throughout the 60s and also worked with other French New Wave filmmakers. The film was edited to Cécile Decougui, pardon my French. A lot of the editing of this film, which is vastly important, you can't talk about Breathless without talking about the editing, which we're gonna do today. A lot of the editing decisions were made in the editing room. I mean, they're all made in the editing room, but they, they created a very different film than they set out to shoot. At least that's the way a lot of the uh, um, participants in the making of the film describe it. They didn't necessarily intend to do all of the editing tricks from the outset, from the early days of production. And there are a lot of reasons why they did. And I'll come back to those in a couple of minutes. And of course, the film kicked off the career of one of the great French film actors, Jean-Paul Belmondo. And it's one of the sort of preeminent roles of Jean Seberg, the American French um, star who had worked in film before this, but this was her kind of explosion on to the world scene. And she would continue to make films in France and in America throughout the 60s and the, into the 70s until her early death. And Breathless, as written and directed by Godard with influence from Truffaut and Chabrol, is a foundational text and it's a foundational text not just of the French New Wave but of all the new waves of the second half of the 20th century when it came to or when it comes to um, young, fresh, new, exciting, pushing the envelope of what film can do and it's a film that has influenced nearly <laughs> every filmmaker since it came out to a certain degree. I mean, it's a film you watch in film school, you watch in academic film studies, you learn about. Um, it's constantly being uh, revived. It's been remade in the Richard Gere film. Posters of it appear on the wall and other films. It's, it's one of those texts that you can't escape. Um, and so I wanna talk a little bit about why. In this video, I wanna talk about 
one of Breathless's key scenes, one of its most influential scenes, one of the scenes from the film that one could argue changed cinema, and that's the drive around Paris. But first, just a little plot background. Belmondo plays Michel. Michel is a petty criminal, and as the film opens, he is in a seaside town away from Paris, and he steals a car with the aid of a young woman. He leaves her there and drives to Paris, and he's talking to himself. And some of the groundbreaking stylistic decisions of the film are made already on this drive, including the use of jump cuts and also breaking of the fourth wall when he talks about the beauty of France and what a great country it is. Si vous n'aimez pas la mer, si vous n'aimez pas la montagne, si vous n'aimez pas la ville, allez vous faire foutre. Oh on this drive, he's speeding, he's talking about speeding, he's talking about how cars are made to go fast, and he attracts the attention of two motorcycle police. One of them finds him, and Michel shoots him. Ne bouge pas, ou je te brûle. And now he's on the run. And he gets to Paris and he looks up to Berg's Patricia and they are already in love. In fact, he's been talking about her on the road to Paris and they have this kind of relationship that's very cool and seems to be sort of convenient but also very loving, which you can tell from this great long set piece in a hotel in the middle of the film. And he wants to get her, get some money that he has, and, and take off and not get caught by the police. She's trying to sort of build a career in journalism. <laughs> she sells newspapers. And at one point, which we're about to discuss, she, she goes to meet a journalist friend of hers for, for a press conference. Um, and this is kind of what the film's about. It's a, it's a funny take on the Lovers on the Run film, you know, the Bonnie and Clyde, They Live by Night, and so on, because for most of the film, although Michel is trying not to be caught by the police, he's not actually on the run. He's hanging out in Paris, planning to flee, or preparing to flee, let's say. Um, and in the middle of this, they're walking down the streets of Paris, and Patricia tells Michel, I have to go meet a friend, and he says, Come with me, my car is right over there. And we get this scene. Pourquoi tu cruel? Où est-ce qu'il y a des taxis? Bon, très bien, ma voiture est à l'opéra. Tu veux que je te dépose? Ok. Et ta Ford, tu ne l'as plus? Elle est au garage. Allez, quoi, je reste avec toi. De toute façon, j'ai mal à la tête. On ne sera pas ensemble, mais je voudrais rester à côté de toi. Non, ce n'est pas ça, Michel. Pourquoi vous êtes triste Parce que je suis triste. C'est idiot. Pourquoi tu es triste C'est mieux quand je dis vous ou tu. Pareil. Je peux pas me passer de toi. Tu peux très bien. Oui, mais je veux pas. Regarde une Talbot. Elle est belle, deux litres cinq. Tu es un garçon. Quoi Je ne sais pas. Patricia, regarde-moi. C'est interdit d'aller voir ce type. Hélas, hélas, hélas. J'aime une fille qui a une très jolie nuque, de très jolis seins, une très jolie voix, de très jolis poignets, un très joli front, de très jolis genoux. Mais qui est là C'est là, stop Attends, je vais me carrer, quoi. Non, c'est inutile. Bon, fous le camp. Je ne veux plus te voir. Fous le camp Fous le camp, dégueulasse That's it. A drive and a conversation. I have shown this scene a lot in film classes. And oftentimes today, 
students, modern students, I am a modern guy, <laughs> um, don't pick up at first on what's so important about it or what's so groundbreaking about it. Um, and that's in part because its influence and the influence of scenes like it from Breathless and from other New Wave films has been so profound that what's going on in that scene is kind of derogueur in filmmaking today. And mainly that is the use of jump cuts like this. And this. So, first I just want to talk briefly about the jump cut. What it is, what it isn't, and then get back into why it's so groundbreaking in the scene stylistically, but also, for those of you who watch my channel, you know I will love, how that those stylistic decisions mirror or um, develop or interrogate the film's narrative character and themes. So let's talk a little bit about the jump cut. A jump cut is, first of all, an edit. Now, we use cut to talk about editing a lot in film, and it can be a little bit confusing. First of all, let's just remember that the word cut or the term cut comes from the actual cutting of film. Film was once, and still is for some filmmakers, a material that had to be handled. And when films are shot, you've got about 10 minutes of film in a canister, traditionally, this has changed somewhat. So you can do one take, another take, another take, another take until your film runs out. And then you load another reel into the camera and continue to shoot. Then when you go to edit it, you have to cut the film. You might have three takes of the same scene and you might decide, I like all of take one. Then you're gonna cut out take two and take three, discard them, preserve them for archivists, please. <laughs> or not, I don't know. Um, and there, take one is a single take or sometimes it would be called a single cut. Or you might decide, I like the first part of take one, but I like the second part of take two. And the typical approach to this would be to find a natural break in the scene. For example, when a character stops talking for a second and looks at the ceiling, and then <laughs> they look back at the person they're talking to, that pause, might be a great place to put a cut and then it can seem, it can come across as seamless. So it might still look like one take. Um, or, I mean, there are lots of ways to do this and we don't need to go into the fundamentals of editing, but splicing together part of take one and part of take two, you have a cut in the middle. Of course, when that scene ends and we wanna to go to the next scene, we also need a cut, right? So there are many different types of cuts in filmmaking. Part of the problem with jump cuts, and the reason why I'm being a little bit pedantic about this, is that the way we use the term cut generally and the way we use the term jump cut are often a little bit confusing. So let's first just talk about what a jump cut isn't. A jump cut isn't a smash cut or what's often called a smash cut today. What do I mean by a smash cut? A smash cut is a very particular time type of match cut wherein an action is taking place and the audience sees this action happening and then there's a match cut to a different time and a different place where a similar action is happening. One of the most effective ways we see this used is in sort of horror thriller action movies where someone has a weapon, let's say a hammer or a knife or a board or a baseball bat and there's a victim and we see the knife coming down or we see the hammer coming down and then there's a cut to a knife 
stabbing a watermelon or to a hammer hitting a nail, something like that. This creates a jump in the audience <laughs> because it perverts our expectations. We were preparing for that hammer to hit that skull, which we don't really want to see. Maybe we're, if we're special effects people, we're wondering how they're going to do it. But if you're immersed in the film, you're like, ah, and then all of a sudden there's a watermelon there. It's not what our brains expect. It makes us jump. That's not technically a jump cut, although people will use jump cut to describe that kind of cut. That's a match cut, and you'll often hear that particular type of match cut described as a smash cut. Um, there are lots of match cuts. Match cuts are used all the time. The most common one is a match on action, which is when, for example, I walk this way into a doorway, and then there's a cut as I walk through the doorway into a new room. Now those two rooms might be in different studios, in different houses on location. They might actually be right next to each other. There's no way to know when you're watching the film, but the editing of that match on action makes it appear as if I'm walking naturally from one room into the next room. That's called a match on action. Movies use them all the time. Sometimes you also get a graphic match. And this is a little bit different, and this is the one that's often confused as a kind of a, a jump cut. And that's when we're looking at a image on screen, the graphic, and then we cut to another similar looking image. And these can be used for humor. So you have, for example, films have two people and they're about to have sex and the man's getting on top of the woman in this case. And then the man starts to fall down and then a train goes through a tunnel. That's a graphic match, right? <laughs> I don't know how graphic, <laughs> but that, that's a graphic match. And graphic matches can be used for all kinds of things. One of the most famous one comes from um, Lawrence of Arabia, when he lights the match, it's a, it's a match cut with a pun. He lights the match and then it turns into the sun. Graphic match. Um, and then perhaps the most famous graphic match of all time is the uh, bone into the space station in 2001 A Space Odyssey. These are often also described as jump cuts because we're jumping, in the case of 2001, through time, through thousands and thousands, hundreds of thousands of years of time. And so it feels like there's a jump, but that is not technically a jump cut. What is a jump cut? Well, when we get into defining what a jump cut is, there can be more confusion here because there are actually a few different types of jump cuts. Um, the original ones, which it seems were happy accidents and were also sort of developed in France, it seems, by Georges Maillet, the sort of trick filmmaker who directed A Journey to the Moon and, and many more films, um, who realized that, um, I think because he lost a piece of film, although there are different versions of the story, that when you have a, a piece of film and, and somebody or something is there, and then you cut out a little bit of the film at a dramatic moment, it can make it appear like that person has disappeared. And then you can choose to cut back and make it appear like they've reappeared again. Or if I had an assistant, I don't make all these videos myself, I could have done the same thing and had myself disappear and have someone else in my place or have a guitar in my place or have a gorilla in my place or whatever. So you can do the appearance of magic, appearance and disappearance and so on. Um, and Mayes used this effectively throughout his career. So in some sense, a jump cut comes when you just film one action and then cut out a middle of it to create this effect of something's there and then it's not or vice versa. Extending that, you can also do jump cuts where you keep the person or the object in the frame, but you cut out moments of the action so that when a person is talking, when a person is walking, when a person is doing, taking part in any action, you can cut out middle parts of film, or in this case, the digital, and you can have the effect of the person having moved significantly, noticeably, but with the action of movement removed so that when 
it appears on film, there is a jump, right? The removal of a piece of film in the middle of a sequence that would otherwise be used in its entirety. And it doesn't have to be turning and moving. It can also be in relation to this axis on the camera. It gets used in horror a lot when somebody's approaching the camera and like that. Another type of jump cut that has as much to do with camera placement as it does with editing decisions, they both come into play, is when a camera is repositioned within a scene, but when it does not abide by the 30 degree rule. I don't want to talk too much about this. It's kind of a film 101 thing, but if you're unfamiliar with it, the 30 degree rule is simply the concept that, you know, a camera has an axis, right? So if a camera's in a position, I can be pointing it over there and then I can pan it on its tripod or whatever device it's on, my shoulder, um, a crane, uh, a kind of a dolly, whatever it is, and I can pan it this way and I can pan it this way. Um, and I can do that in one take or I can cut so I can have it over here. I could film this whole action but cut out this middle part or I could film here and film over here. The 30 degree rule says that for continuity editing purposes, those cuts should take place when the camera's angle is greater than 30 degrees, right? So it's about 30 degrees right there. So if you want to cut in this room, you shouldn't cut between this and between this. You should cut outside that. So from over here to over here. The reason for this is that if you cut within 30 degrees, the change in angle is noticeable, but the change in geography is not noticeable. It's not noticeable enough. So you get a jump effect, right? So if I'm pointing a camera there and I have a person, even if they're not moving, if they're just sitting and talking, and then I move the camera there, and the same, and I film the same scene, it's gonna look like the person has moved within the frame. This creates a disorientating effect. The jump cuts in the scene from Breathless are not very dramatic. And that's one of the reasons that uh, many of my students today don't notice them at first. And, and many viewers don't notice them today because we seem to have a moment of continuity. And if you're just focusing on um, Gene Seberg sitting there in the car looking glorious, or if you're just focusing on Belmondo's dialogue, which is at once playful and then a little bit nasty and then kind of fully nasty at the end, and you're just kind of listening to him and watching her, you might not notice that the background keeps changing or keeps jumping. And it's that feeling of jumping within space that is what why it's called a jump cut. It's not the jumping from one space to another, like in the match cuts or graphical matches that I talked about earlier, it's the jumping within the same space, within the same time, within linearity. It creates an impossibility and it's jarring. And in 1960, it was particularly jarring because for the previous 60, 70 years, filmmakers for the most part, and I'm vastly generalizing right now, but filmmakers in Hollywood, outside of Hollywood, in Europe, elsewhere, have been working on various approaches to continuity editing and continuity style. There was no board, there was no sort of international body of uh, immersive cinema. Maybe there was, there used to be international bodies of everything, but I don't think so. Um, it was the filmmakers themselves at first experimenting, figuring out what worked. I want to cut from here to here, but when I do it in this amount of space, it doesn't look right. But when I do it in this amount of space, it looks right. And boy, it seems to be about 30 degrees. So let's just call it the 30 degree rule. Um, probably if you measure it exactly and go 31 degrees, you're going to have the same effect. Um, and over time, this approach to filmmaking, at least in narrative storytelling filmmaking, um, traditional filmmaking, not the avant-garde and so on, they began to cement themselves. And in America, they cemented themselves so much. And I think in much of Europe as well, the tradition of quality in France, 
that producers and studios began to expect them. And there are all kinds of elements of continuity. There are all types of um, elements of filmmaking that are meant to be invisible. So we talk about invisible edits, but we also talk about invisible production design. You're not supposed to notice the mise en scene. We also talk about the invisible camera. You're not really supposed to notice the presence of a camera. Um, so in, when we watch something like Cool Hand Luke or Easy Rider, when there's a lens flare in the 60s, this would have been very dramatic because the lens flare is announcing the presence of a lens. The camera is no longer invisible. We're not supposed to notice the presence of the actors, the, the, the performer themselves, which is why when Belmondo breaks the fourth wall in this, it's quite dramatic. And I think breaking the fourth wall these days is, is still somewhat dramatic. We don't expect it all that much, although we're more used to it today than we would have been in 1960. So while these rules about invisibility and continuity were not sort of written down in a handbook anywhere, they were the expectations. And when those rules were broken, for the most part, I'm sure some of you are like, what about this and what about that? Uh, but when they were broken, for the most part, it was seen as sort of unprofessional or um, shoddy or not the right way to make films. One of the reasons the French New Wave is so groundbreaking is that those filmmakers and the adjacent filmmakers, as with Agnes Varda in, in Cleo from 5 to 7, which I talked about recently, is that they decided that these rules didn't matter or that they, I shouldn't say that, but they decided that these rules didn't have to be followed all the time. And they seem not to have done this out of some sort of manifesto or, you know, out of some sense that we're going to go out and smash the rules and break the rules. It, it's oftentimes more playful in that they wanted to see what film can do. What can we do with film? And what effect will it have on an audience? How does it change the nature of the storytelling? How does it change the audience's relationship to the characters? And why can't I do this? Why can't we see Cleo walk down the same step three or four times? There's no reason not to if it fits within the, the sort of world of that film. And in Breathless, Godard establishes quite early that this is going to be a film that, for 1960, is pushing the envelope stylistically. So let's go back and talk just a little bit now, finally, about the jump cuts in this car ride around Paris. First of all, as I said, these jump cuts are just playful. And Godard is doing them because he can. And as many people who worked on the film have said, it was not initially planned to be that way. So they filmed driving around Paris and they filmed, as far as I know, correct me if I'm wrong in the comments, they filmed the dialogue in more than one place so that they could choose which scene worked best with the dialogue. And it was in the editing when they started to get into the rhythm and flow and various people have claimed that it was their idea to do the jump cuts that they came to the decision that they could have, they could cut different pieces of that film together, um, but have one continuous piece of dialogue over it. And that, once you notice it, is what starts to bring in a sense of irreality to the scene. So we have that first, that what we're witnessing is impossible, <laughs> right? Now, early on in the sequence, it's almost possible because the cuts at first are made in between moments of dialogue. So Seberg, Patricia will ask Michelle Belmondo a question and then there'll be a cut and then he'll answer it, then there'll be a cut. And then when he starts to go on his sort of poetic waxing about this beautiful woman that he's in love with and how beautiful she is, but how cruel, the cuts come as he finishes a sentence. But as a sequence progresses, the cuts start to get closer and closer and then intrude upon his dialogue so that they're actually happening mid-word. And, and that's where it becomes fully impossible. So that's the first thing to notice about this scene and to notice why it was in 1960 so like 
refreshing or exciting because Godard is saying in this film all of a sudden, I don't have to obey the laws of realism. I don't have to obey the laws of physics. I can do what I want this way. I can return to a maze style of, you know, special effects within this film that's otherwise grounded in a sort of cinema verite realism. I don't have to keep up with that realism throughout the film. I can mix them, I can match them, I can do what I want. Another thing to keep in mind is the film's themes and the way the jump cuts subtly reinforce the film's themes. And a lot has been written about Breathless. I'll, I'll post a few things below, but I mean, this is one of the, whether you like the film or not, this is one of the greats of film history. So pages and pages have been written and ink and more ink has been spilled about it. Um, <laughs> So anything I say, probably somebody out there has disagreed with, but it's a, it's a very cynical film in a lot of ways in that it's about cynical people. So it's a film about cynicism, but also its approach to them in the way it kind of doesn't judge them or even really maybe doesn't care too much about them is also very cynical or at least it can be read as very cynical. Um, Michelle is a petty criminal. We know that from the beginning in the very first scene, he steals a car, but he's also a murderer. Like he murders that police officer in cold blood. So he's not a good guy. He models himself famously on Humphrey Bogart and there are references to Bogart throughout the film, but Bogart in part because most of his great roles take place during um, uh, the classical Hollywood era when you couldn't really lionize the villain. Bogart, as cynical as his characters were, as kind of, um, as willing as they might have been to get the job done, Bogart's characters always had a code. It's the thing about the sort of the film noir detective, which he often played. Um, they always had a semblance of ethics that they would cling to. Maybe not in Treasure of the Sierra Madre, but he pays for it in that film. Um, Belmondo does pay for it. Michelle pays for it here. But when he does, it's almost like an afterthought because Belmondo's presence in this film is just so beautiful and magnanimous that you, you can't help but kind of fall for him. So this is another way that the film's very influential is that we have like the birth of the modern anti-hero in a lot of ways here. Um, and that is very cynical. I mean, whenever you get a, a, an anti-hero who is dark, who's a criminal, Travis Bickle, Loki, and, and a film shows them sympathetically and asks you through its runtime to start to hope that they'll win the movie, there is a level of cynicism there because it's, it's putting the audience in the position of aligning ourselves with, we can call him an anti-hero, but he's a villain. He's a murderer. He's also, I mean, it's 1960, yada, 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 but a misogynist and not the best boyfriend in the world and, and so on. Um, but he's cool, so it's okay, right? And that's occurring in this scene. So we have seen Belmondo, Michelle, in the opening scene with a girlfriend. Now Patricia is on her way to meet a journalist coworker and he's jealous and he starts to get really mean about it. So there's a, a kind of double standard cynicism there as well. And not to put sort of too fine a point on it or to nail it on the nose. So much, ooh, we could do a match cut there. <laughs> Smash cut. Smash. <laughs> <laughs> that cynicism is mirrored in this decision that realism, reality, continuity don't matter. Who cares? And there's a sense throughout the film. Who cares? That you can find this sort of morally questionable or morally reprehensible, and that's fine. That's totally up to you. But it was in 1960 exciting. It was new. 
And if you've watched my series or any of my series on the rise and fall of New Hollywood, it's worth remembering that in 1960, many, not all, but many of the filmmakers who would, you know, craft what we call the New Hollywood from 1967 to the end of the 70s, were young and impressionable film students. They were going to some of the first film schools, film programs, and they were watching French New Wave films and going, you can do that? And you see it throughout the filmography of the, the new Hollywood filmmakers, starting with kind of the foundational text, Bonnie and Clyde, Arthur Penn, very influenced. In fact, Godard, as a lot of you probably know, was signed on to direct Bonnie and Clyde, but he had too many differences in his approach with the writers and producers, so ended up leaving the project. But he was attached to Bonnie and Clyde for a while. Um, but Penn pays homage to, and, and D.D. Allen, editor D.D. Allen, to the French New Wave. So that influence was starting to be felt in America just a few years later in the films that would really change Hollywood for, for more than a decade. There's a lot to this sequence that's been very influential. Um, I think that his discussion about the beautiful parts of, of her body uh, probably also influenced the very kind of jump cutty ice cube sequence in, in Do the Right Thing. Um, but there's another interesting part that I just thought I'd mention that isn't necessarily related to the jump cuts, but is related to the film's cynicism and also the film's sense of um, who cares, the, its sense of like, let's do whatever it is that we want. And that is in, in this, this moment right here. Je ne veux plus te voir. Full camp. This comes at the very end of the sequence and he's jealous. He doesn't want to admit that he's jealous because he's cool. So he turns his jealousy into this sort of um, resentful, it's very misogynist and gross, but it's also kind of typical. And he uses his French word, and I'm not a French speaker, dégoulasse. And it's, it's translated here as it makes me want to puke or you make me want to puke. In different versions and in, in different sort of reprints of the film, the English subtitles change to disgusting uh, and other words get used. The reason that it's interesting or kind of important is, is this is also his final words in the film. And um, if you haven't seen it, go watch it and I won't spoil it for you. But he says the same thing at the very end of the film. And she doesn't understand him. Um, and there are moments in the film where you see that, you know, French is obviously her second language. And she asks a person who's there, what did he say? And that person slightly mistranslates or maybe doesn't what Michelle says. Um, so it's worth watching and reading about to see how he does it. But this moment here is a foreshadowing of that and there, there's a little bit of cynicism in that last part because his final words could have a lot of meanings but the translator um, minimizes them in a way that's designed intentionally or not to hurt Patricia which is also what he's trying to do here. Um.